God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You know, at times, we must be very confusing to God. At times, we act like we've even forgotten whose house we have come to as we come to worship this morning. At times, when we have a different view of the world or of ourselves than we think God has, how we struggle with that. How we who take the name of Christ and call ourselves Christian will listen to other voices to shape our opinions rather than the voice of scripture or church. How difficult it is for us to understand at times what the Lord requires. To know what God expects and what it, God wishes to see in us and how we live that out in our lives. The prophet Micah had much the issue in the first lesson we heard read this morning. As Exodus shared those words, did you notice how the people of Israel must have played the same game we often do in our prayers? What have you done lately for me, God? Micah reviewed the greatness of the Exodus from Egypt. He reviewed the giving of the law by Moses and the giving of the prophets and all the other events of freedom that occurred. But what are you doing for me today, God? As we look back in our lives, often we if we're honest, can see the hand of God each step of the way, shaping and forming and guiding us. But how many times we fall in that trap of expectation? What would impress the Lord? I ask if we're pretty regular in our worship attendance, if we say our prayers most of the time, if, if we would be known as a good neighbor, is that sufficient? And Micah is saying, no. For what, O mortal, does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? To do justice. That means living in this world in a way that doesn't accept things as they are, but a vision of greater fairness. George Eliot, the author, said, if not making life simpler for each other, what is life for? to give voice to the voiceless, to lift those who are oppressed, to do the justice this world needs. That is our call to follow God. Would God be impressed with a thousand rams for sacrifice? That's a lot of sacrifice. Would he be impressed with 10,000 rivers of oil? No is the answer. And I don't care how impressive our financial figures are on the back of that bulletin or on the front of that bulletin. That doesn't impress the Lord. God is calling for something greater, something more, for us to do justice. I think that's what Jesus was talking about in the gospel we heard of the, what we call the beautiful attitudes or beatitudes from Matthew. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you want justice, live justly and treat others as Christ would say as you would treat yourself, to show that mercy, to show fairness, to be considerate. That's to do justice. Martin Luther King's funeral, they played a, a speech of Dr. King or a sermon of Dr. King's at an earlier time when he dealt with the idea of his own funeral. He said, if you must have a eulogy, make sure it's short. Don't bother to mention the Nobel Prize or how many honorary degrees I have or what schools I went to. But mention that I tried to feed the hungry, reach the lonely, and stand for justice. And then came that quote where he described himself as a drum major. A drum major for justice. A drum major for peace. A drum major for righteousness. For as we stand for the need of others, we must realize we are among the most blessed in this world, among the freest in this world, and have the greatest opportunities of any other people on this earth. 
And the prophet would look at us more than even others and say, do justice, be fair. Treat other people in a way they should be treated. Now, how do we motivate ourselves to do that, I think, is in the next step, to love kindness. Now, most of us are kind people. Most of us would be gentle in life. He doesn't leave it just saying, be kind. That's one of the scout laws we will mention perhaps next Sunday when we come to Boy Scout Sunday or in March to Girl Scout Sunday. It says, love kindness. That is, have a passion to treat other people as your sisters and brothers, to see a world without borders, to be considerate of the person in the way you want to be treated. Again, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we begin to live without hidden agendas, when we really care for the other person, when we're willing not only to hear but to listen and try to understand, we begin to create a different climate for us to live in. It's the power. Dr. Charles Allen was a beloved Methodist minister in this town for many years. He served Grace Church, so loved the name, the street beside Grace Church, Dr. Charles Allen Drive. He was there for about 15 or 20 years, and then he moved on to First Church, Houston, Texas. Dr. Allen has written many books, and in one of them he told the story of a man who built up the courage to go ask his boss for a raise. Now, that's a hard thing to do. For always you think you're worth more than perhaps those you work for are worth. So he built up the courage. He was go in and ask for a raise. She prayed all day. She worried all day. She wondered what was happening to her husband. And he came home from his meeting with the boss and meeting of his day of work. And there on the dining room table was set the table with the china you only use at Christmas and Thanksgiving. And there in the kitchen was cooking his favorite dishes. He said, somebody from the office called and told her. And there was a note she handed and said, I'm so proud of you, honey. You deserve that raise, and I'm so glad you got that raise. I love you very much. Let's celebrate. And so he sat down. They had a great dinner together, great conversation. They were celebrating what was to be a, a better life for them. And as he helped clear the table, you could tell something strange was happening. As the husband got up to help clear the table, a note fell from underneath his plate. And the note said, I'm so sorry, honey, you didn't get that raise. You deserved it, but I'm still proud of you, and I love you. Charles Allen made the point, that's kindness. Not in response to some gain of victory, but in whether it's pain or gain, to respond and to know and to love. The prophet says, love kindness. Tom Peters, the business writer, said that every great action in history starts with an enthusiasm. And we must have that enthusiasm to go the second mile, to turn the other cheek, to love and care for those around us, even the least and the last and the lost and the lonely, to be kind. There were some Horrible stories that came out of late Tuesday, early Wednesday, but there were some beautiful stories of hotels where I opened their lobby and Targets and Home Depots and CBSs. I'm going to leave out somebody. I won't name all, but most stores opening up. People walking down the expressway giving out hot chocolate and coffee and food and so forth to the cars that were stranded. People opening their homes. Your own church staying open to, to house some people that will snowed in on Mount Vernon into fee. We had to wait, for example, to almost 8 o'clock for the last child to be picked up at the preschool. That is an editorial we. I was at home. Uh, <laughs> I, I've done this twice in my ministry, once here and then back in the early 80s when we had another storm like this and Decatur had to open up a soup kitchen and I directed it from my house. Uh, it happened to be my day off that time. This was, I happened to have an appointment I had to go to. But whatever the reason, we can think of many examples of kindness and hospitality that we can celebrate as well as mistakes that were made. And we can understand those who made the mistake. One of the mantras I live by is nobody bats a thousand. Folks, we need to treat each other kindly. 
despite how hard that price might be. So we do justice, we love kindness, and we walk humbly with our God. Now, that's harder for most of us than it would seem. I think maybe the poster child for the lack of humility might be Ted Turner. I mean, we're going to show, Mr. Turner, as we tear down Turner Phil, how long you might stand in this world. But one time Ted was quoted as saying, I would be perfect if I had a little humility. (laughs) You know, we need to know where God is and where we are and to walk humbly with God. Whoever wins the ball game tonight, somebody's going to get in front of a camera and say, all praise to God for giving us this game. Folks, I will tell you without any doubt, the good Lord doesn't care who wins that game. The Falcons aren't in it. No, truth, God wouldn't even care then. And I'll tell you, I've been asked the same question on the collegiate level. That same thing applies. God really doesn't care, but he cares about the safety and protection of the players and the fans. He he cares about people and not the things we can achieve in life. When I was in seminary, the pope of the Catholic Church was John the 23rd, one of my great heroes of the faith. He came in as a very humble man and opened up the doors of the church to change at Vatican II and reached out to other Christians around the world. And because of that, I was able to take some of my seminary courses out at the monastery with the monks. I mean, all sorts of barriers were disappearing. Much like our present Pope, Pope Francis, a very humble man, not taken away with the glamour and the power of the position. Well, the story is told when John the 23rd, when his family first came from their little village to visit him, they were starstruck, mouths open, in awe, but they were very afraid. And finally, John the 23rd leaned over to him and said, don't be afraid, it's just me. True humility. The legend is St. Francis was out hoeing in his garden, and someone came by, what would you do if you knew the world was going to end tonight? He said, I'd finish hoeing my garden, to understand the need for humility and to be humble. That's what Jesus was talking about in much of the Beatitude. Blessed are those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. If you're not so full of yourself, maybe God can satisfy you. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let us remember what really matters in life. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When you can really feel the depth of your need, God can give you strength. I was paid an honor this week. I was asked by Fran Miller to come down and do the devotional at the State Senate. It was Wednesday morning. I didn't get to deliver my devotional, but I was going to basically give them an abbreviated version of this sermon. What is required of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. And I was going to tell the senators, most of the laws you make are very complicated and difficult to understand, and judges have to interpret. But not so with the prophet. Three simple steps. Justice, kindness, and humility. In response to this hope, I hope we will stand and affirm our faith as we can in using the creed found on page 7 in the hymnal. 